All right, good morning. morning. This morning was going to be a shorter sermon. Uh, We are finishing up in Ezekiel this morning, so we'll be doing that. Um, Somebody told me that was my 100th sermon today, so this is the 100th sermon. So if you've watched it this far, pat yourself on the back. Um, No, I'm not doing anything special because it's the 100th one. It should be a regular sermon. (laughs) So this morning's title is Waste Cities. Now, uh, Two weeks ago or so, someone had sent me an email, actually several people had sent me an email, that uh, the city of Sandpoint was actually featured in Fox News, if you guys saw that. Um, I will try to link this news article to the video this morning, Um, so I still have that email. But anyway, what what the Fox News um, article, what it was about was, it says, this red state is becoming an expat community for families fleeing Western liberal bastions, okay, an expat, expatriate, to remove yourself from citizenship, right? So not really, they're not really um, pulling out of the U.S., they're pulling out of liberal states. And the red state, of course, is Idaho. It says, get me to Idaho. West Coast, ex- West Coast expats share what drove them out of their home states. So it says here that Idaho's population soared more than 12% from 2018 to 2023, making it one of the fastest growing states in the nation. Most of the growth is due to people moving in, according to local real estate agents. Estimates of 98% of the new clients to real estate agents are from outside of Idaho. All right. While they come from all over the country and even the world, the West Coast dominates the in-migration. California... Washington, and Oregon, those are the three primary states from which people come, according to the mayor of Coeur d'Alene, a city that's uh, about an hour south of us. It's mostly major cities, or San- in Sandpoint, a small city that just saw its, uh, has seen its population grow nearly 13% from 2020 to 2022, according to the mayor, and many new residents are looking for a community and government that's aligned with their political philosophies. So you can understand that's why Idaho is growing so rapidly. So most of the time, and you guys have lived here long enough, and I have to a point that most of the time the people that move here are um, similar to, they have similar ideologies to what we have here. Most of them are very patriotic and things like that. As a matter of fact, when I was looking at moving here a few years ago, I was at the Home Depot getting some things, and the lady, I told her I was looking at moving here, and she's like, well, we're, we're very conservative here. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's why I'm wanting to move here, you know. God, guns, country, all that, and, and everybody. And I came down, and I saw the American flags everywhere, and assault rifles and pickup trucks. And I'm like, yeah, this is definitely the place for me. <laughs> you know, I thought, well, all that's missing here is you need a few good old boys from the south. Yeah. You know, that's all you're missing. You know. And then we start talking about jacking pickup trucks up and all that, and they're all looking at us like, what are you talking about? You know, Mickey Thompson's, stump jumpers, you know. He says, in most, it's mostly major cities or just outside of major cities where they're going. And they, the people say, when, when they move out, I'm not okay with what's going on. I don't want my guns taken away. Get me to Idaho. That's what the people are saying when they move out of these states, specifically from the West Coast. And the article goes on and on about different people and their stories about where they moved from and why they moved here to Idaho. And most of them are fleeing the major cities, especially in California. I've lived... I lived in California a few years, and yes, it is definitely, it's a nice place to visit, but it is not some place I'd live, ever. So, that actually brings us to our sermon this morning. Uh, We'll continue in Ezekiel 36, and this will be the final uh, sermon concerning that chapter. So, we've, that's been the subject of the last three sermons. Uh, So, Ezekiel 36, verse 33 is what will be this morning. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded. So, just like in the last few sermons, I'm calling your attention to that you there. Of course, we know that the Ezekiel's prophecy is dealing with the Israelite nation of, or I'm sorry, God's children, the Israel nation, right? So we know that's us, the people in this chapter. uh, In chapter 36, uh, the entire chapter is actually addressed to national Israel, just so we know. Just refresh your memory a little bit. So this prophecy here is very clearly directed at one people or one nation, okay? And notice that God says, in that day, which we've been studying for the last few weeks as well, we know this is obviously end-time prophecy. 
So this is not concerning something that man will do, you see. God says, I will do this. This is not something man's going to do. Now, I'm not minimizing our duty or our responsibility, uh, but we have because we know that God has plans. Our duty and responsibility is still to conform to God's word and his laws while we live in this nation. But the cleansing is something that the Almighty will do, you see. And that cleansing cannot be done by any other power on earth, just so we know. God also says that he will, it will be all iniquity, not just some. So we understand this is end-time prophecy. And iniquity, of course, we know simply means out of line with God's word or his will. Okay? So let's compare Scripture to Scripture. We'll go to Isaiah this morning as well and see what he has to say. Isaiah 61, verse 9, And their she seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. And notice again, here this is physical. This is a physical thing, and we know that they is, of course, national Israel. And we see that this prophecy has already begun in this nation. So we are looked to as a Christian nation. Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. And notice here we have salvation in the Old Testament. It's always interesting to find verses that have that. And now do not limit this scripture, just because of the eye there, to the individual. We have to consider the whole context of the chapter that we've been reading from. And you'll see that it's repeatedly mentioning prophecies like this pertaining to a particular nation. That nation is called Zion. Okay, so this is national Israel, Zion, in time Israel, is where these prophecies are directed to. And you'll notice the language that here in Isaiah is similar to the language that we've been looking at in the earlier sermons in this morning to uh, that of Ezekiel's. And it's just different terms and different symbols, which we'll go over. Next verse, 61.11, For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. And you guys understand this is exactly what we're going over last week in Ezekiel, about how God has blessed the land. And you see here, we understand that since this is prophecy, we know that God decided ages ago, that he was going to do something with this nation that he selected and that he was going to cleanse and sanctify that nation. So this is all in God's plan. It's a destiny for the one nation. And he also says that he's going to, what he does with this nation and to this nation will be an illustration to the other nations on earth. Okay, on earth. That's the plan. And that is... Here, when we read these things, these are to be taken as they were going to be done on the earth, not the heaven of the churches. It's not all up in heaven somewhere. These things, it says in this prophecy, will happen on the earth. Okay? And it's not going to take place in a church either. So you see, this is national. This will be upon a nation. That nation will be on the earth. And what happens to that nation on earth will be noticed by the other nations on earth. And that's what we were talking about this morning with Matthew, how they have this heaven. And if you preach the heaven of the modern church, these prophecies don't make any sense at all. And as, even as Miss Martha said, well, in their worldview, where do the meek inherit the earth? If you're either off in heaven or the earth gets turned to ash or you inherit your own planet or whatever. So these scriptures tell course we know and we see the language here this is the gospel of the kingdom once again all right that's the cleansing redemption and restoration of God's people Israel that's the gospel of the kingdom and it's not often taught if at all anymore Isaiah 62 verse 1 for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Now, the word Jerusalem here is symbolic of the new Jerusalem. That's where the church is messed up. All right. That is not that city over there in old Palestine. 
This is God's plan with who? Zion, New Jerusalem. Same verse. Again, you'll notice that the last part of this verse, of course, is the Lord's work. And that will capture the attention of the other nations. You see, the lamp that burns. Remember what Jesus said about a lamp being up high so it lights all that's in the house, right? It's exactly what he's talking about. So, next verse, Isaiah 62, 2. And the Gentiles, or the nations, shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Who will be called a new name? Israel. They'll be known as Christians, right? One day, and they'll be noticed by the other nations on earth as the Christian nation. As the Christian nation. So Zion, the new Jerusalem, will be a nation with a new name, a Christian nation. You see? It's all there. And we recognize this also as kingdom prophecy. Yet this also speaks of a time when it is in full fruition, the kingdom. Okay, because you'll notice that everyone will see everything, that, and we'll get into why this would be full fruition here in a second. Isaiah 62, verse 11 and 12, Behold, the Lord is proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, notice that's the daughter of Zion, this is not the old mother, this must be end time prophecy, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him, and they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. So you see more kingdom language concerning the nation of Israel. You understand that this is all over the Bible. This is consistent through all prophets. God's plans with Israel. Sometimes it's named Judah, sometimes it's named Israel. But this is God's plan for his whole people. We'll look at Jeremiah 33, verse 8, which we're in Jeremiah 33 earlier, a few sermons ago. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity. So this is when the kingdom is in full fruition, because we're not there yet, whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. So you see here, this is in Jeremiah, another repeat, repetition of what God's plans to do, what God plans to do with his nation Israel. And you see here, all transgressions, all iniquities are gone. So this, is, this must be in time prophecy, but this is when the kingdom is in full fruition. And you'll see, this is not the heaven of the church. Apparently, Zion, the new Jerusalem, will have all of their iniquity taken away in sight of the other nations. Okay? That's our eschatology. That's what we believe. You see, the kingdom has layers and ages itself. It progresses too. All right? So, sin... And we see what is sin, according to John, right? So sin is the transgression of law. So this passage that we've read here tells us that God intends with his Zion nation to bring them back in, on line biblically, in line with his law. This law is what makes the world go round. It's what makes the kingdom tick, his law. It's always been that way, and yet people want to put it away. And we see... Once again, that God's actions with his nation will be seen by the other nations on earth. Very important that we understand that. Jeremiah 50, verse 20. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none in the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. All right. This is the whole nation will one day be brought into harmony with God's word. This happens to Zion on earth. So, everything within the nation will be affected. You see, our kingdom age prophecy, if it's a nation on earth, and these things are going to be done to that nation, then our government, our education, our economics, our money, our work, and recreation will all be within with harmony of God's word. You see, so you get a glimpse of what kingdom life may be like. 
You see, it doesn't just stop spinning the earth because the kingdom is here. It seems like, as you read more and more layered prophecies about end-time Israel, we have a lot of work to do in the kingdom as well. All right. So, we see that something tremendous has taken place here because all of Israel's iniquity has been removed. And it will be noticed by the other nations on earth. So, they're here too. All right. So the prophet Jeremiah here, he agrees with what Isaiah said and what we read in Ezekiel. Now let's go back to Isaiah, and this time it'll be chapters 17 and 24. Now you should always study Isaiah chapters 17 and 24 together, because they're both end-time prophecies, and we'll see that as we go on. Isaiah 17, verse 7 At that day shall a man look to his maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel, and he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. So whenever we're looking at Bible prophecy, specifically end-time prophecy, it's always important to note the time and the indications that tell when the prophecy is to take place. So, Here's a little cheat sheet for you when you're doing prophecy. To determine the timing of prophecy, you must determine, you must always study the context, okay? And understand what exact time a prophecy is concerned with and what prophetic vision, what the prophetic vision reveals and foretells, all right? So this particular prophecy we see has not yet been fulfilled entirely. So that's why it must be end time prophecy. But it is in the making. All right? So God is moving upon the affairs of men and nations, and the results are what we read here. Men will look to the Almighty with respect, and they will honor and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. That is in the works, but it's not been fulfilled in its totality yet. So we understand it's looking forward to end time Israel. We also read that we also see that other man made religions will not be looked for or sought after in this time. And we're not there yet, are we? No, not yet. There is not going to be any religious observances or practices in existence in the kingdom that are not in harmony with God's word. So we understand that. Very easy stuff. Isaiah 17, verse 9. In that day shall his strong cities be as forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. So, this is what we saw in the Fox News article this morning, was it not? We see that our cities are in trouble and that they've been forsaken. Right? And you read, this is just one prophecy concerning this. Forsaken cities, waste cities is all over Isaiah. And a lot of end-time prophecy in Jeremiah as well. Isaiah saw this and prophesied about it. And it's fascinating how this prophecy here was just in the news last week, right? Concerning the town we live in. So this is telling us what's going on in our own nation. The nation, the Zion of Bible prophecy, right? It applies to us. An uppermost branch, you'll see, left desolate and alone. And if you go through enough end-time prophecy, you'll find that our cities in the kingdom will not be like our cities today. You see? Isaiah 24 now, verse 12 and 13. In the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree, and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. So again, concerning desolate cities, we all know that the olive tree is symbolic of whom? Israel. Israel, at all times. And we know that the shaking up is God stirring up the people or the nation for his own purposes. And he often shakes up world governments, our governments, man-made religions, man power, man-made uh, religions, man's power. He shakes these up. And most often, God tells us that he does that so that we learn to rely upon him alone. That's what God says most often when he's shaking up the nation or he's sifting the nations and other end-time prophecy. So, the outcome is told in verse 14 of Isaiah 24. 
They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. So we shall sing for the majesty of the Lord, you see, after the shaking up. Not for a religious group or even a political party. You see, those things are not our hope of salvation and redemption. When the Lord shakes up the nation, when he causes our cities to be desolate, Israel is going to be in such trouble that they'll look to the Lord and sing of his majesty. That's the gospel of the kingdom. It always has been that throughout the entire Bible. You'll read this over and over and over again. And these are double prophecies because Israel did get in trouble. Okay? As they always do, right? Isaiah 51, 3. This should be very familiar to kingdom believers. For the Lord shall comfort who? Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. You also read Micah 5. This is an exact, almost word for word of Micah 5 as well. If you look at Micah, other end time prophecy. So the Lord will comfort who? Zion. Not Palestine. This is something that you'll notice is when these are read in modern churches, they'll say Zion is the modern Palestine and that's who's been comforted all these years. They won't notice that it's this nation, the Zion of Bible prophecy, that has been comforted this whole time. And you'll notice that this occurs prior to the revelation of Christ and his second coming. Okay? Now that's an important aspect to this. Because apparently God's going to do something with the nation before his second coming that's going to be this. So all we have to do now, since we're the ones upon who the latter days have come, is look for a nation that's been comforted in this way. All right? And we're all aware that this nation has already been comforted like no other nation in all of history. Okay. And then, of course, you see, and Pastor Sheldon Emery did an excellent job at explaining this as well, and the old Jerusalem is not the new Jerusalem, when he says that the wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Now, you will not find that in the God-forsaken desert of Palestine. You will not find those things. So these things have been made manifest in this North American continent only, ever. Isaiah 58, verse 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. So this is the destiny God has in mind for our nation. This speaks of the restoration of the kingdom order in end-time prophecy, which is another thing God has in mind. But he has to do quite a lot to our nation first before we can become his missionaries, his priests and kings in the end of the age to the other nations. He has to restore our nation first, which is what he's promised to do. And of course, we know that was the work of Christ on the cross. We'll go back to Ezekiel. And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that pass by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and inhabited. So here's where we are today. So you see, Fox News said people are leaving their cities and finding better places to live. Right? The cities have become waste places, desolate. Then the kingdom restoration will happen within the nation, and the cities will be repaired. They'll rebuild them. Then what? People, the nations will notice that Zion has become like the Garden of Eden because of the Lord's work, because of the Lord's work. So you see this all goes together. Israel will be in trouble. Their cities will be abandoned and laid waste. The Lord, we will turn to the Lord, sing of his majesty because of the work he's done. Then the nations that see us on earth will see that we have become like the Garden of Eden. And you see God has had his hand in our nation's history since its inception. So this is always a work in progress. You see, and we see this is similar language that we found in Isaiah. And we know, again, that this cannot be applied to Palestine. We know these things. And most every teacher in church limits 
end time prophecies like this to that little country over there. And Ezekiel obviously is a prophesying about our nation here. And you notice here that it says people will wish to come here, which exactly fits end time prophecy. If you go through Joel, Micah, and Hosea, you'll see that. And I realize that in the nation today, there are many things that do not belong in the Garden of Eden. I know that. But Bible prophecy also states that those things will be removed. That's the work of the Lord as well. That's part of the kingdom restoration of his people, the national Israel, the Zion of Bible prophecy. And of course, here we see fenced. When you see fenced cities, fenced is protected, secure, peaceful. Exactly opposite of our cities this a- in this age, is it not? Right. So this, there is hope in what you see in the news. Okay, yes, people are leaving the bad cities. This is part of God's plan of restoration for the nation. And you can see all these prophecies that I've read this morning happening right before your eyes because we know the kingdom progresses like this. It does that. Why it does? God's purposes. I don't know. I don't know why he does the things he does, but if you understand that the cities and it got this bad for Israel and we know what the kingdom is to be, we have something to look forward to. That's why the kingdom is future. That's why the kingdom is future. Ezekiel 36, 36. Then the heathen, and remember we looked at that word, Hebrew, goy, goyim, nations, people, others, strangers perhaps, The heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. This is God's intention. And you understand, the heathen that are left round about you, that could be in time prophecy that applies to the kingdom age, because I understand that there will be other nations that are not in the New Jerusalem that will see these things and want to know more. That's where the historicists, preterists, that's where they get it mixed up. If all this has already come to pass, then what do we have to look forward to? But we, If everyone but Israel is removed from the earth, then who are these people that are supposed to be looking to the, us? The singing the majesty of God. You see, it just doesn't work out. So yes, apparently there will be other people, other nations on earth at the time that Israel is restored. And if you can understand that, most all of the kingdom age prophecy in the Bible starts to make sense. The exact timeline, I don't have it mixed, m- mapped out. But we do know that this is a progression, and this is God's plan with the Zion nation. And we'll close in Psalm. Psalm 130, verse 7 and 8. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So this is Psalms saying exactly what we read in the prophecy. So you understand, David was a prophet. Right? Look, here's another one. Psalm 131.3, Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Hope in what? The kingdom gospel, the restoration of Zion. That's our hope. This verse means everything to us because we know who that is. You see? Because we know who that is. We know where we live. We know our nation. Psalm 92, verse 4. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the work of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. There again, the psalmist understands that God has plans. He doesn't know them all, but he knows that his plans involve Israel and that his work is for the good of us, his children, at all times. We'll close in Psalm 67. I'll actually read it here. The whole psalm, it's only seven verses. Now I understand that this is from Psalms, and you'll find all of this language is in time prophecy. And it ties it all together very neatly. Psalm 61, verse 1, God be merciful unto us, and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. 
God shall bless us, and the ends of the earth shall fear him. Now you understand, I'd love for the newer churches to read this to me and explain those, all this earth language in there. There is nothing about floating up into heaven, getting angels wings, or playing harps. This is all about Israel's hope and the work of the Lord that's to take place on earth. And you notice here it includes other nations, all nations. And it says that God will judge those people. And then God will govern the nations upon the earth. I don't know how you could get any clearer than that. Most of the time, people will close the book on the Old Testament that they will read from Psalms and Proverbs. They will do that. So next time you're in a fundamentalist church, have them read Psalm 67 explain it to you and let me know what they say because this is all end-time prophecy concerning one nation on the earth and God's plan for it, the kingdom gospel. So that's all we have for today. We will start a new study next week. And God willing, we'll get into, I've had a lot of questions about this um, Zion of Bible prophecy. I've been mentioning that, and apparently there are people out there that have no idea what I'm talking about, which is fine. That's fine, because we have a long way to go. But there are, I'm happy to say, a lot of new listeners. A whole lot of people are tuning in now than they have been. And that's good news, and it comes with a lot of questions. As a matter of fact, a viewer had emailed me and said, Pastor Reed, I intend to send a whole list of questions that I'd like you to answer on uh, in your sermons. And I said, all right, well, send them on, and, and I'll get to them as I get to them. So that's good news. People are wanting to learn. They want to hear these things. And they're very curious about how it is that we understand America as the Zion of Bible prophecy. We say that in passing. We say the gospel of the kingdom. And people say, well, what is that? What do you mean by all this? And I said, well, to us, it's very elementary stuff, but it means that we need to do a little bit of review, which is fine. That's exactly what we'll do. We'll do our new study on that next week. 